David Gilbert brings you the current news from the world today and how it relates to Bible prophecy. Understanding the end time events leading to the peaceful world tomorrow. Ladies and gentlemen, Stephen Lloyd Gilbert. Good evening, friends, and welcome to this welcome to this June 4th, 2014 edition of Nightcast. Friends, we kind of clipped the opening tonight. I'm sorry, we kind of clipped off a little bit of our introduction, but uh, all of you know this is Nightcast. We bring you today's current news related to the Bible and prophecy, and today's news. There's some giant hail and tornadoes across the U.S. Midwest. Uh, giant hail. Let me just bring it forward. We'll go ahead and uh, start it. There's no commentary with it except a little bit of audio behind it. You can hear these hail, hailstones smashing the front of a windshield. Giant hail, as the headline says for this, has pummeled the U.S. state of Nebraska, leaving vehicles and homes damaged. Severe weather has been sweeping the Midwestern states with tornado warnings in southwest Iowa and northwest Missouri. In a moment, you'll see uh, you'll see the tornado in a moment. Boats have been used to rescue residents cut off by flash floods. This footage here shows baseball size hail in Wilbur, Nebraska. Right in front of us. There it is. Going right across the road. Don't hit the brakes, go for it. Don't this, hit the brakes, go. Meanwhile, at the same time, in Missouri Valley, Iowa, an eyewitness captured the Go up there. moment Go up this 90-mile-per-hour winds ripped the roof. Broad rotation right out here in the field right beside us. Ripped the roof off a gas station. Oh, 911, that's a gas station. That's a tornado tearing apart everything. Right. Okay, friends, so uh, what's going on? You know, it, the question in the news has been this lately. How come there have been so many more? And if you look at it, you'll see this is the case if you, if you have one of those earthquake applications for your smartphone or get onto an earthquake website. You'll see there's many more earthquakes than usual. Now, in the past year, we've had huge number of earthquakes happen every day, but the uh, the magnitude of the earthquakes and the amount of earthquakes you'll see of late has been dramatically increasing, and the question has been, why? The experts on ex earthquakes say there's no logical reason for the dramatic increase in the uh, number and magnitude of the earthquakes. Well, there is a reason. You know, it, it's... Uh, you're not going to find the answer to this scientifically, friends, but there is an answer to it. If you simply believed the great God and would take a look at his word, you would see that, that in Matthew 24, Mark 13, Luke 21, Jesus Christ, in plain language, describes as he answered the disciples who asked him, what would be the sign of your second coming, you know, of the imminence of your second coming, coming of, of the immediacy of it? And part of his answer was, during the fourth seal, which is predominantly a seal of loimos, as Christ explained it in the Greek word that he used that Matthew, Mark, and Luke wrote, wrote up, loimos, meaning look it up in your Greek-English lexicon or just look in your Bible as it's rendered or translated, and it's, uh, uh, well, Greek-English lexic lexicon will give you a little more, uh, like a good dictionary, it'll give you more, it'll define it even in more detail. It, it's pestilence, disease epidemics, the plagues of Egypt. That's the loimos part of it, but Jesus Christ, under this same seal, before the fifth seal happens, he also said there would be seismus, an increase in seismic, seismic activity. There would be seismic activity in diverse places, in different places, in greater frequency and magnitude. That was part of his answer to the disciples who asked him, what would be the sign of your second coming? And 
so those who are scientifically inclined who say, wait, we're scratching our heads. We don't know why there are so many more earthquakes now happening. Duh. Let me just put it this way, if you don't mind. Those of you especially who uh, believe in the great God, you know, let me, let me address not you, the choir, but those who are saying, well, we, we can't explain it. How come there's so many more earthquakes now, you know? Well, dummy, take a look at your Bible. Believe the great God when he says the, there's an answer to it. When you see more earthquakes in diverse places, know that the return of Jesus Christ is imminent. Now, that doesn't mean like your soul-saving evangelists and preachers and their big tent evangelical meetings and all, you know, trying to get you to walk down that aisle and give your heart to the Lord. Um, it doesn't mean that he's coming tomorrow. Before Jesus Christ returns, there has to be, uh, Christ has said there would something else would happen. There will be a fifth seal. And that's going to last two and a half, three and a half years. Well, two and a half years will be the first big hunk of it. And then there will be some heavenly signs, the sixth seal. And then there will be a year of the day of the Lord. That's the seventh seal. And I, although I don't have it pictured here, I just have the first six seals pictured here on this chart because this chart shows you the seals that are described in the book or the chapter of Revelation 6 the sixth chapter of Revelation. The sixth chapter of Revelation doesn't get into the seventh seal. That begins in Revelation 8. And it, it takes, it. well, let me change this chart to the whole chart. This is just half of the chart. The whole chart looks like this. Actually, the first six seals aren't even as much as half. We don't even go halfway over to the full half of the, of the screen. The seventh seal on the right side takes up more than half of the, scene, uh, of the screen because the seventh seal by itself is more than just one thing or one, one event. It's, it's the seventh seal consists of seven trumpets, and then the seventh trumpet consists of seven last plagues. So it's a big deal, and this is the day of the Lord. This is the time of the Lord's wrath against those who've taken the mark of the beast during the fifth seal, the Great Tribulation. Let's come back to just the first six seals again, uh, friends. Uh, the Great Tribulation is still part of the days of, of man and Satan, and that depicts Satan's wrath. Some people get that confused. The Great Tribulation is not the wrath of the Lord, not the wrath of God. That Great Tribulation is the wrath of Satan unleashed and he's angry because he knows he has but a little time left and this will be the time the great tribulation coming next the next major event in prophecy it will be a time of World War three it'll be the time of the revival of the Holy Roman Empire which was revived for about nine years in the last century between 1936 and 1945 under Mussolini, who was the head of the Holy Roman Empire then, who was the sixth head of that empire. Very short-lived resurrection, not too overwhelmingly glorious, but it was a, a type of the final and last head, the seventh head to be revived yet in the future. During that time, when Mussolini became that sixth head, God was able to use it to help his end-time servant, Mr. Herbert W. Armstrong, to see and understand that Revelation 17, verse 10, was a prophecy, a scripture for th that came alive during his lifetime, when he was about 44, 43, 44 years old, until he was nine years later, up until he was 53 years old, about 53 years old. Because, um, let's see, uh, April. In April of 1945, Mr. Armstrong would not have turned 53 yet. He would have still been 52. But during that part of his life, when God was using him uh, uh, in a big way with purchasing broadcast all over the United States, and then uh, it was a few years later, 
Mussolini died April 28, 1945. It was uh, five years to 1950, another three. Another eight years later that God opened up the door to have Mr. Armstrong broadcast around the globe with his broadcast going on Radio Luxembourg in 1953, opening up his broadcast to Europe and Radio Luxembourg being the powerhouse of radio stations with an antenna system and location that just that just um, uh, enveloped Europe. And before he went, before God opened that door for Europe that way, eight years, at, uh, well, going back more than eight years, because now 17 years before that, God began to open up to Mr. Armstrong's understanding that Revelation 17.10, let's read that real quickly. I've got some, some very significant news stories for you tonight, friends. I don't want to take too much time with this to take away from that news, but let's just quickly cover Revelation 17.10 says... And there are seven kings. Now, this is seven kings that are pictured in uh, Daniel 2, Daniel 7, Daniel 8, Revelation 13, and Revelation 17, depicting a time since the days of King Nebuchadnezzar, who was the first head of a certain kingdom, down to the head of the worldwide kingdoms that will come during our day. I'll have a comment on that as... As President Obama speaks from overseas in a moment in one of the video clips, he's going to make mention of their, he never wants to see another worldwide empire you know, that bullies the world again. Well, Mr. President, pardon me for uh, po uh, pouring cold water or raining on your parade, but God himself, if you just look in your Bible and pray and fast for understanding, you can understand my words that tell you that there is a resurrection of the old Holy Roman Empire that will be ridden over by the Pope coming yet. It will be the seventh and final head. And God gave it to Mr. Armstrong to understand that it's coming in our lifetime in this way. Listen to verse 10 of Revelation 17. And there are seven kings. Five are fallen. That means up to... a up to the point of the timing of this scripture, Revelation 17, verse 10, which the timing was not the days when John, the apostle John, wrote it on the Isle of Patmos. No, that, this was a future prophecy. John couldn't even understand this because these five kings were not in existence at the time John wrote this. These five kings that are fallen came into existence after John died, who wrote this scripture, who wrote this prophecy, after he died, those five kings came into existence. At the time that this prophecy is meant to represent, it says the five kings are fallen. Well, that time didn't happen until after the fifth king had fallen. And it still yet didn't happen because it says, and one is. After the fifth king fell, the Roman Empire went into the abyss for several hundred years. And then, and anybody who wanted to understand this couldn't understand this until 1936, where it says, and one is, and that one who is, he made a bold claim. And the newspapers put it in, in headline type, but not on the front page. They buried it a few pages under, but God caused Mr. Herbert Armstrong to see it, where Mussolini claim to have resurrected the Holy Roman Empire after he invaded and conquered Ethiopia. And when Mr. Armstrong saw that, he got on his knees, prayed, and God opened his mind to understand, Mr. Armstrong, this is the fulfillment of the first part of Revelation 17, verse 10. And five kings are fallen. There are seven kings. Five are fallen. And one is. God showed Mr. Armstrong between 1936 and 1945 that, that one is was Mussolini. And so Mr. Armstrong, hey, this prophecy is for right now, today, the, today when he was living. Now, it's still for us, friends, because even though the one is is now no more, the last part of this verse says, and, and the other is yet to come. 
there still is one yet to come. So we're now between the one who is, who whose is time was between 1936 and 1945, Mussolini, the sixth head of the Holy Roman Empire, and the other is not yet come. He's still not yet come. The seventh head, we don't know who he is yet. It's pretty safe to project that as, as was in the past, in most cases, the emperors of the Holy Roman Empire were German emperors, and the next one, very likely, will be a German emperor who, will, who, in a coronation ceremony hosted by the Pope, will be crowned by the Pope in the Emperor's Hall in Frankfurt, Germany. Frankfurt, Germany being the home of the ECB, the European Central Bank. We have a story related to the European Central Bank and the Euro and Europe coming up in a few moments, so, and I better get to that. I wanted to give you a little... A little you know, this is our program is news related to the Bible and prophecy, and I usually try to save my commentary till later into the program, let you see a little news first. But uh, friends, tonight uh, that first story kind of got me excited because it triggers off the question: Why more earthquakes now than ever? The answer is part of what Jesus Christ said. Let's take a look at it real quickly, then we'll move into the next, the next stories. Take a real look at it real quickly in Matthew 24, where Christ was answering his disciples' question: When will be the, uh, what will be the sign of your second coming, and of the end of this age, this society as we know it, under the government and kingdoms of man, mankind? Jesus Christ said, "For nations shall rise against nation." He said, "He said there will be many coming in my name, saying, I'm Christ.'" And let me pull this forward. That represents the white horse, as depicted in Revelation 6. Christ saying, Many shall come in my name, saying, I am Christ, and shall deceive many. So there be false deceivers, false religious leaders. And the second seal, the red horse, Christ said, And you shall hear of wars and rumors of wars. See that you be not troubled, for all these things must come to pass. But the end is not yet. For... Nation shall rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom. Nation against kingdom and king and, and uh, nation against nation and kingdom against kingdom. Friends, that means world war. And so, when Christ said, uh, "All these things must come to pass, but the end is not yet," and then He says there would be world war, nation against nation, kingdom against kingdom. Christ was essentially saying. Uh, the end is not yet. The end wouldn't come until at least 1914 because we, we didn't have truly world war until last century, until 1914 when round one of world war broke out. That round ended in 1918 and 1919, went into a recess until 1938-39 when round two of World War broke out and then ended in 1945. And now we're in another recess, waiting for round three, the final round, the round that'll kick off the fifth seal, the Great Tribulation. And in between then and now and all, and as a result of war and also as a result of, of uh, lack of rain, uh, drought, we'll have famines. The the the, the third seal of Revelation 6 is depicted by a black horse that Jesus Christ described to be a, a scarcity of food, famine. And that naturally follows war. It also naturally follows drought and lack of rain. And the fourth seal, which also follows conditions of war and, other, and, and, and conditions of drought, is the pale horse depicted by primarily by loimos, disease epidemics, pestilence, the plagues of Egypt, also in the seal is the seismos that Jesus Christ described to be earthquakes in diverse places. That's what the King James puts it in other translations. But he actually used the word seismos, which means commotions in the air, such as gale force winds of all kinds, and commotions on the ground, such as earthquakes and volcanic eruptions and tsunamis and wildfires and floods and the like. And this, this, the part, and terrake was another thing in Mark 13, 8, that Jesus Christ described to be happening before the fifth seal, before the great tribulation, the great, the mega trouble. There would be 
Terake meaning trouble, just trouble, trouble of all kinds, literally and figuratively troubled waters, as the Greek English lexicons define it, and mobs and seditions and that kind of thing. And on the seismus of this pale horse, in the news you just saw that, 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 that huge, uh, huge hailstones uh, hitting uh, cars and homes uh, in, in Iowa and, and where else did they hit? In Nebraska. All right, friends, now let me go on because there's some more stories. I'd love to rattle on some more to you, but I think I've given you the gist of where you should see. Listen, this is not a time to be playing around. This is a time to get deadly serious because the, the thing that's coming, let me put it back up just one more time. The thing that's coming in the fifth seal is something that Jesus Christ described in Matthew 24, verses 20 through 22 as the time of Jacob's trouble, a time that's so bad, no time since the beginning of the world no nor ever shall be, comes upon, comes upon us. Let me read it to you as he says it here. Verse 20, God, Christ says, instructs, but pray that your escape, your flight, be not in the winter, neither on the Sabbath day. For, the reason why he encourages us to pray that prayer is because then shall be great tribulation such as was not since the beginning of the world to this time, no, nor ever shall be. It's the time of Jacob's trouble, a time especially troublesome to the nations of Israel. And you know, friends, God has said throughout his word that the nations of the world are blessed through the offspring of Israel, the nations of Israel. And during the time of Jacob's trouble, when Jacob is troubled, the rest of the world is troubled because the blessings to the rest of the world come through Jacob, as God explains. And verse 22, God goes on to say, Christ says here, and except those days should be shortened that kick off during the Great Tribulation that becomes the beginning of World War III where we now have stockpiles of nuclear weaponry like that did not exist during World War II. And as Mr. Herbert Armstrong has said, when man develops a weapon, he uses it. We didn't have nuclear weapons during World War II the way we have them today. Oh yes, the United States developed the atomic bomb and dropped a couple of them on areas of Japan, but when you understand it, the atomic bomb is simply the trigger today for the hydrogen bomb, much, much bigger, much more ex explosive bomb, the hydrogen bomb. The atom bomb that two were dropped during the end of, toward the end of World War II are just the triggers for the mega hydrogen bombs. And now there's so many of those stockpiled that, that more than 50 times, more than 100 times, the whole world could be blown over more than 100 times. We don't even know anymore how many are stockpiled because nations do it underground and they keep it a secret. Oh, they claim to report so many, and what they report, it only takes one time, and, and they're at least a hundred times over. It only takes one time over to blow up the whole world, and even those who push the buttons go up. You know, it wipes out all of mankind, all the animal world, every living creature would be blown up, except Jesus Christ says, and except those days be cut short, be shortened, there should no flesh be saved alive, alive as the Moffat version puts it, but for the elect's sake, for those who are called as first fruits during the spring harvest, Christ says, those days shall be cut short, shall be shortened. I'll intervene and prevent mankind from blowing up all mankind. And then Jesus Christ will set up his kingdom on this earth for those few who are left alive because during the battle of Armageddon that ensues at that time, before Christ steps in and intervenes, mankind will have blown up, uh, will have killed 90% of the population of the whole world, just leaving a small percentage, 10% or so, um, alive to live on over into the millennium that Jesus Christ will reign and rule over. All right, friends, I didn't mean to make tonight, I got a lot of video, I didn't mean to make tonight's uh, long, long, long talk on this, 
but this is news related to the Bible and prophecy. Now, I think that kind of clarifies a stage we needed to set for the rest of the, tonight's videos. In uh, Europe, there's a big D-Day uh, celebration been going on the past couple of days. They've been preparing for this for a long time. And uh, the, it's the 70th anniversary of D-Day, the biggest seaborne invasion the world has ever seen when Allied forces landed on the coast of France on June 6, 1944. It's being comm commemorated. And friends, this one uh, me, relates and means a lot to me. Actually breaks me up as I read some of this because my dad was a paratrooper who would jump off these Dakota airplanes into enemy territory. And he volunteered for this jump. And one of these jumps, 80% of the men who jumped out of the airplanes never didn't... Uh, uh, didn't survive before they hit the ground. The Germans were mowing them down with uh, machine gun artillery and uh, they, they died in the air before they hit the ground. My dad was in a, squ a squadron of men who volunteered for a jump and the volunteers were taken ahead of everybody else over to France for a scheduled jump. And then the uh, generals or commanders of the war decided to move the jump up ahead of schedule. And because of moving it up, they said, we don't have time to stop and pick up those men who volunteered that we dropped off ahead of time in France. So they just flew on over and left those men down there. And with that ratio of four out of five men who jumped off of that plane being killed in the air before they even hit the ground, my dad's chances of survival of that jump would have been one out of five. That means my being here <laughs> is, is less likely than likely by, by uh, five to one, or you know, however that ratio goes. You know, only one out of five made it. And uh, so they skipped. My dad, he volunteered, and as they left the volunteers behind, and the volunteers didn't do the jump. The men who didn't volunteer did the jump, and 80% of those wound up dead before they hit the ground. Anyway, crucial to the success of the mission was the airborne assault, and this was spearheaded by the DC-3 uh, and C, uh, the DC-3 uh, DC slash C-47 Dakota plane, uh, codenamed, or, you know, called for easy reference, the Dakota plane. Hundreds of aircraft dropped thousands of Allied paratroopers on enemy targets in Normandy. Their job was to protect the men on the beaches from German counterattacks. Duncan Kennedy has this first report for his friends. It's a sight not seen across southern England for seven decades. A formation of Dakotas heading to France to mark the D-Day anniversary. Flying over Portsmouth, it was the plane the Allied commander Eisenhower called the aircraft that helped win the war. We flew with them as they crossed the channel, noisy, vibrating, but as always, reliable, just as they were on D-Day. 83-year-old Dick Harrington was among those on board with others in their wartime paratroop uniforms. They're paying homage to the brother he lost in World War II. We are where we are because of them. It's that simple. 70 years ago, 900 of these Dakotas made the mission, carrying 25,000 paratroopers. Today, it's a sunny, peaceful day. Then, they were flying into battle. Each plane carries the special invasion markings. Many Dakotas were brought down by flak, but enough got through to overwhelm the Germans. Dakota veterans say they owe their lives to it. They could come in low, they could take big loads, and they seem to be able to fly in the most difficult situations, in little mountain valleys and places like that. Oh, I love the Dakota. This afternoon, the Dakotas arrived over Normandy, thousands turning out to witness the aircraft that helped bring liberation. Very special, uh, very emotive, and uh, hopefully it honored the people of 70 years ago. The DAC, as it was known, may not have had the glamour of a Spitfire, but it delivered men, kit, and victory. 
Duncan Kennedy, BBC News, in Normandy. Thank you very much, Duncan Kennedy, for that report. We have another report now, friends. It was today that uh, these Dakotas flew to France, dropping more than 100 parachutists over Normandy to start the French commemoration of the 70th anniversary of D-Day. Tom Hepworth has this report. Bagamut, the last of the Dakotas to arrive here on their mission to France, looking just like she did when she flew from Greenham Common almost 70 years ago. The black and white stripes were painted onto all Allied aircraft for D-Day to make them more identifiable. Maurice Bell served as a paratrooper in the Burma campaign and has fond memories of the Dakota. Absolutely wonderful. Sailors, I think, love their ships. I think parachutists would love the Dakota. Jumping from it was so straightforward and they were so reliable. We never seemed to have trouble with Dakotas. Three rules in the air. Repeat them after me. Always look before you turn. Always look before you turn. Turn right. A briefing for the modern day parachutists who are paying around £200 each to take part. 120 or so wearing authentic uniform will jump out over Normandy to begin the French commemoration tomorrow. The silk chutes that we used to use back in that time period are banned by regulations now, so the paratroopers that want to still commemorate the, the memory, we use what we call the MC-1-1 or SF-10A style parachutes. They're steerable, unlike the canopies of the time, and they allow us to work on the smaller drop zones of Normandy. This major event wouldn't have been possible without local people and efficient organization. It was just like it was back then. Soldiers got quarters uh, assigned to with locals. And yeah, we met our host last night, very friendly lady from Germany, by the way, yeah? uh, with two little kids. And we spent the evening with her. It was great stuff. And we're going to go back tonight. Yeah? The families were all lined up in the nave of the church. They had cleared the pews to one side. They all had labels with their names and numbers on. And the parachutists had equivalent names and numbers. And they just slotted one against the other. What started out as an idea in the pub down the road back in September really has taken off. And friends, where uh, Tom Hepworth there in this report said that this, this flight and the drop and all would happen tomorrow, this report was delivered to me late last night. The video was made yesterday, and the jumping, the parachuting, as I mentioned earlier, it happened today. And all of this is a good prelude to some of the stories coming up next in our news report for tonight. We're going a little bit over time because, dear friends, we may not be broadcasting a whole lot longer. Things are moving. More earthquakes than ever. The scientists can't explain why. As I mentioned a moment ago, and I, all I really meant to say, I thought it'd be a good idea to give you some detail, but I wanted to tell you by putting that chart up on the screen and saying, look, the next major event in, in prophecy is seal number five, the Great Tribulation, that follows after the fourth seal when there's disease epidemics and there is increased seismic activity, earthquakes in diverse places in greater frequency and magnitude was Christ explanation that would tell you that the that the fig tree and all the trees are beginning to have tender branches there uh, the leaves are beginning to sprout summer is nigh Christ explaining that what he meant by summer being nigh was that the fifth seal is about to hit off on us friends it's nearly at the door and the news should be showing us this. That's why there are more earthquakes than ever and why scientists can't explain it. There's nothing they say. There's no logical reason why the earthquakes are increasing to the frequency and magnitude that there are. Well, he's right. There is no carnal physical explanation for it. But spiritually, according to God's word, there's an explanation and an understanding, and the wise will understand that this is Jesus Christ's word being coming alive right in front of your eyes, where he said, when these earthquakes increase in frequency and magnitude, know that summer is nigh. Know that the fifth seal is nearly at your door. It's next thing to happen. And it's with this great increase, scientists can't explain it, Look in your Bible. Christ said when, when there's an increase, that's a signal that the fifth seal is 
is just down the street, about to hit your door. And when it hits, it's going to be too late for some people. And by too late, I mean some are going to be left behind, thinking, well, I know all this good stuff. I was supposed to be taken to the place of protection and nourishment and final training and safety, as we used to call it. But I, I didn't get to go. I'm still here. Well, you still have time to develop a Philadelphia attitude and to believe the doctrines that God gave us through Mr. Herbert Armstrong that says, although there be a great and magnified Laodicean attitude, there's a certain time when the era comes. We'll talk about that another time. Now, next thing in our news relates to something that will relate to this fifth seal coming together. The European Central Bank is to take decisive and controversial action to stimulate the flagging economy of the Eurozone. One policy expected to be announced tomorrow is the use of negative interest rates charging banks to put their euros on deposit at the ECB to spur them to lend more to households and businesses. In advance of the bank's announcement, the BBC's economics editor Robert Preston has been to France and Germany to access the state of the Eurozone. And friends, for some reason this opening frame of the video doesn't look like the report that goes with this. If you don't mind, let me take a close look at things while I, let's just change the slide for a moment. Let me have you, let you take a look at these first six seals of Revelation while I just take a closer look at this. I, uh, nah, I get, this is it. This is supposed to be the story that uh, relates to my introduction for you on this where, um, uh, the BBC's economics editor Robert Preston has been to France and Germany to assess the state of the Eurozone. In the slow economic lane, a number of the countries that use the Euro, amid deep concerns that faltering growth in the Eurozone will turn into that sinking feeling. I'm in the middle of the Rhine with France on my right and Germany on my left. Now, the French economy is stagnating, whereas in Germany, the economy is growing relatively strongly. It's not quite the difference between famine and feast, but it's not far off. A French cement maker in Malouze near the German border would dearly love France to break free of its concrete boots. The building business is linked to investment, and for an individual to buy a house or build a house, they must have confidence in the long term. They must have confidence in the business they work for. And if that confidence isn't there, the investment doesn't happen, the banks don't lend, and it's a downward spiral. A museum of chic vehicles made here sometime before the euro replaced the French franc. A simply magnificent French motor, the 1929 Bugatti Royale, redolent of France's industrial glory days. Unfortunately, right now, there isn't a lot of room in the French economy. But the European Central Bank hopes that by cutting the cost of money, it can recharge the engine. But a few miles over the border, in Freiburg in Germany, the cheaper money that France and Italy want isn't quite so popular. We're expecting the European Central Bank to cut interest rates further and perhaps create some new money. Would that be the right thing for Germany? Well, for Germany, it's uh, just the opposite, uh, I would guess. Uh, Germany is a, is a country which could uh, live with a little bit higher interest rates and that would be much better. And if a Herr Professor is uneasy, what about other Freiburgers? Why is it, would it be bad for the European because Central Bank? Our, because our savings are uh, uh, becoming less and less. It's better to keep the economy running. And that means cutting interest rates? Probably, yes. It's mostly about sprucing up the banks, persuading them to lend more to fix the Eurozone's economy, which matters not only over there, but also here, because the Eurozone is the biggest market for British businesses. Robert Preston, BBC News. Thank you, Robert Preston. Friends, in our next story, 
You're going to hear President Obama give a warning to uh, the president of Russia uh, regarding some of their doings in the Ukraine. And you know, friends, I'm like a lot of you, except that I've had uh, ambassador college training and ambassador clubs and spokesman's clubs, and God says that all of us who have his Holy Spirit will be among the wise during the end time who have a special understanding given to us by God. And there are some even in the world with a carnal mind that can take a look at things if they stand back, the elder statesman. We had an excellent Secretary of State some years ago. We have played video of him speaking in the past few months. But our present leadership doesn't want to listen to the elder statesmen. They want to listen to the young men that tell them, yeah, get in there and we're the big United States. We'll beat your bongos off, you know. At a time when we're ignoring God's laws and we are the, uh, I was going to say the victims of, but we're the, we're the just recipients of what God says in Le Leviticus 26 where he says, if you obey my laws, I'll bless you. I'll make you the head, not the tail, the lender, not the borrower. I'll have one of your men chase a hundred, or five chase a hundred. A few of your men will chase off big enemies. Your agriculture, I'll bless it with all kinds of rain and your cattle, you know. But where are we now? We, United States is now in the worst drought it's ever been in. Men are selling off skinny cattle just to barely try to recapture the money they've put out for the cattle and they've had to feed them and, and feed got more expensive when there wasn't rain and they're just trying to break even or cut their losses let's say and friends people are running around having a gala time as if uh, as if they can ignore the worst drought in the United States ever and not only the United States there are other agricultural areas around the world including parts of Russia including parts of Europe European countries that are having their worst droughts ever too. And that's in certain areas while other areas have the worst floods ever. Now a balanced thing would put those floods where the drought is and bring relief, but that's not the way it's happening. God's letting nature do its very destructive thing if his hand is not involved in it because that's how it's set up. We even ourselves as human beings were made with built-in enmity against God that we have to overcome. It's like we're built with a, uh, a gymnasium around us with all kind of barbells that in order to get to where we want to go or eat some food, we got to lift weights and develop muscle. To get into God's kingdom, we have to develop character because God doesn't want any more Satans around, especially he doesn't want a devil or a Satan as part of the God family. It's enough having a Satan as one of the angelic beings, animal-like beings in God's kingdom. That's enough. And having one of those and a third of the angels that have become demons to have gone in rebellion to God, that's enough. God doesn't want any more in his kingdom, and especially among his own family members, those who are made in the image of God, those who will be transformed and become part of the God family. That's what God is offering us. That's the whole plan. That's the plan from the beginning, was to enlarge his family. You know, when you or maybe are alone, maybe you and one other, and the party's over and everybody's gone home, it can get lonely. And even in billions or trillions or gazillions of years in uh, eternity in the kingdom, there came a point where God got lonely, let's say, and decided, hey, let's, uh, let's enlarge this family. He wasn't Christ then, he was the Word. Hey, Word, you know, uh, let's enlarge ourselves. Let's enlarge the family and have, have more like us. Now, they made angels, but angels relative to God are like people having animals, dogs, cats, maybe even farm animals, donkeys, horses, uh, goats, sheep, um, uh, camels, um, you know, other wonderful animals God made that you go to a zoo and see these wonderful creatures. I showed last night, we closed up the program with a koala bear hugging a tree and we, the man explained, they hug those trees extra and extra uh, 
big hugs on hot days because they're transferring heat from their bodies into the coolest parts of the trees and exchanging the heat for the cool. And uh, makes maybe some of us on a hot day. Whew, I wish I had a tree in this room with these hot lights. I'd hug it right now. But friends, you know, uh, God doesn't want any more rebels. He doesn't want a rebel in his family. And so we have to devel develop character so that when before God gives us eternity, transforms our mortal bodies to immortal bodies, he needs to see and know that we are not going to become a re rebel. Before we give, we're given a body that cannot sin, we have to align our minds with that kind of a body and mind that cannot sin. We have to hate sin. But we're in a body that loves sin and finds sin attractive, as Eve did. She looked at that forbidden fruit and said, well, man, it, it's lustful looking. Man, I, that looks desirable. I want to eat that. And yeah, I want to be. I, I believe this character that tells me I'll be as wise as God. And I'll know good and evil. Well, evil is not something God really wants to know. He wants to forget evil and put evil out of existence. And so, if you're one who loves evil, you are not one destined for the kingdom of God. I tell you that for sure. But uh, our next story, friends. Leaders of the G7 industrial nations are meeting in Brussels with the Ukraine crisis set to dominate talks. It's their first meeting since Russia was removed from the club following its annexation of Crimea in March. Earlier, President Obama warned Moscow against what he called its dark tactics in Ukraine. And friends, I, I started out my explanation the way I did about how we were trained at Ambassador College and in, in Ambassador Clubs and in Spokesman's Clubs and from God's Word about what's, going, what's coming in the future and what's going on in the world. And you know, sometimes, and, and we're trained in humility. And you know, in a way, yeah, the United States right now is acting like a big bully when if it would consult with its senior consultants, you say, hey, wait a second, let's see if there's some reason to understand why Russia wants those countries near it and why even some of the people in those countries near Russia would rather align with Russia. Why could Ukraine not have done business with both the EU and Russia, with part of the country doing business with Russia, and other part of the country that's located more over toward Europe doing business with Europe. Because the countries on the borders of Russia, they make uh, train locomotive engines and related things that are heavily used in Russia, and Russia's the, uh, the big supporter of that big industry there in the border that's in Ukraine. And then parts of Ukraine were given to the Ukraine by Russia. They were one time under, under Russia. And, and the people that are there have Russian backgrounds. And in one way, now this is just me speaking. I don't know some of you may disagree with me, and I, I admit I could be wrong about some of this, but I'm just throwing a few things on the table to think about. In one way, you know, you could say, let's compromise. Let's quickly compromise this instead of having war, 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 and people killing, 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 you know, Russia, take Crimea, let, let, you know, take it and take the other eastern towns and do business there. And y'all, let's all be happy, be good neighbors. You know, we don't have to own it. Y'all can own it if you want to. And, and if you want to do a little business with us too, well, fine. But for the most part, we're going to do business with Europe because blah, 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 that works for us. And the United States, you know, some senior advisors might even say, hey, United States, are you not aware that this Union of Europe, one of their goals is to do away with using the American Yankee dollar as the reserve currency? They're in favor of doing away with uh, the Yankee dollar as the petro currency? They'd, they'd like to have the euro be the petro currency. They'd like to have the euro or something beside the dollar be the... Um, Reserve currency, yeah, of course, they'd really love it to be their money, especially with Germany behind it and the ECB being headquartered right there in Germany, everything. Can't you see what's going on? Brrr. 
No, they can't, because their eyes are blinded. So here we are with seven leaders meeting in Brussels to agree on how to deal with Russia and the Russian president. Paul Adams has this report. A place at a moment rich with symbolism, the Polish capital, where 25 years ago the citizens of the old Eastern Bloc began to have their say. America's president among foreign leaders marking the anniversary. Hello, Warsaw! For the history-loving Barack Obama, this was a chance to celebrate, but also to draw parallels with today and Ukraine. The days of empire and spheres of influence are over. Bigger nations must not be allowed to bully the small or impose their will at the barrel of a gun or with mass men taking over buildings. And the stroke of a pen can never legitimize the theft of a neighbor's land. So we will not accept Russia's occupation of Crimea or its violation of Ukraine's sovereignty. Our free nations will stand united so that further Russian provocations will only mean more isolation and cost for Russia. Earlier, a first meeting between Mr. Obama and Ukraine's newly elected president, Washington promising greater assistance. Uh, the United States has already stepped up in a number of ways. Uh, we're supplementing uh, the assistance that the IMF is providing with uh, $1 billion uh, in additional uh, loan guarantees, and uh, we've discussed additional steps that we might take to help during this reform and transition process. With the Americans pushing for a meeting between Mr. Poroshenko and the Russian leader Vladimir Putin, Ukraine's new leader says he's ready to talk peace. We are ready to present the plan for peaceful regulation of the uh, situation on the East. And uh, we think that the next several days would be very important, crucial for the Ukrainian uh, history and for Ukrainian perspective. In eastern Ukraine, the fighting continues. At a border guard camp in Luhansk, pro-Russian rebels helped themselves to guns and ammunition after government forces decided to leave. Elsewhere, the government is still on the offensive. Plenty for President Obama and his G7 colleagues to discuss as they meet in Belgium. This week of diplomacy now reaching a critical phase. This gathering was to have been hosted by Vladimir Putin in Sochi, now world leaders must agree what they have to say, separately or together, when they bump into the Russian leader at D-Day celebrations later in the week. Paul Adams, BBC News. Thank you, Paul Adams. Friends, our next story is important to what's happening and going on in Europe because of Australia being in a key position as it is. And in this story, you'll see how the mayor of Venice, being among 35 officials, arrested on suspicion of embezzling money that was meant only for city flood defenses, you'll see how it's important, uh, how it's going to affect uh, Europe, if you think about between the lines on it. The project to build new mobile barriers to protect the city from flooding was due to be completed this year, but has been reportedly delayed and investigations looking into allegations that 20 million euros, 27 million uh, pounds, I'm sorry, 27 mi 20 million euros, 27 million dollars, or 16 million pounds in public funds was sent to foreign bank accounts and used to finance political parties, according to reports. Alan Johnston has the full report on this. Venice at its magnificent best, but this beautiful city is in trouble it's gradually sunk deeper into the mud. And now floods come much more frequently. More and more often, high tides drown the ancient piazzas. But there is a plan to save Venice from the sea. Flood barriers are being built in the lagoon at vast cost, and the city's mayor blessed the project when it was tested for the first time. It's certainly a very important and emotional moment it will change the vision we have of the city and its lagoon. But the mayor himself has now been arrested, accused of corruption in connection with the scheme. More than 30 people have been detained altogether and a hundred more are being investigated. Police suspect that funds were siphoned off from this colossal seven billion dollar project and that millions were paid in bribes to politicians, accountants and businessmen. 
This crucially important project aimed at preserving the splendours of Venice is now immersed in a major scandal. Alan Johnston, BBC News, Rome. And friends, uh, important because uh, if Australia's leadership gets in trouble, it just gives uh, Germany wiggle room to come in and take control of Australia. And if you look at history before World War II, as Germany was able to gain control over Australia, it just gave Germany a, a, an arm and a leg up on that kind of thing. And so we're in between round two and round three. Watch for some of the same kind of thing that happened before round two began to happen before round three begins. Our last story for tonight, friends, relates to uh, Syria. President Bashar al-Assad has won a third term in office after securing nearly 90 percent, 88.7 percent of votes cast in Syria's election, according to the parliamentary speaker. And um, let me see. I don't have video on that, but I do have a couple of videos. Syrians have been voting. Uh, now, from a video I have from... Yesterday shows how Syrians have been voting in the country's presidential elections, but only in government-held areas. One of the presidential candidates said President Bashar al-Assad should continue to lead the country. Speaking to the BBC World Outside Source program, Mr. al-Nuri said the president was winning the fight against terrorism. They need Assad to continue leading this country, he said. But he added the standing against Assad, who's not, is, is not as an enemy. Listen to this yourself. You may not believe this. They need Assad to continue leading the country because now he is really uh, achieving victory over the terrorism. So let's I let's be clear here. You're standing. Let, let me, so Mr. Al Nuri, let me just let me just interrupt you. Let me be clear, Mr. Al Nuri. Let me just interrupt you. You're standing against President Assad, but you actually think it's a good idea if he wins. Uh, no, no, no. I, I'm saying well. Okay, uh, I'm saying uh, clearly that uh, I'm standing against Assad, not as as an enemy to Assad. I'm standing against Assad. Because this is, at, at the end, this is competition. I have my vision, he has his other vision. But if Assad wins, I don't believe Syria is losing to. I do believe that uh, either candidate who can make this uh, election and win, I think he's a very much Syrian, true Syrian, believing in his country and believing in the interests of his people. And friends, I'm going to try to close tonight's report at one hour. We extended to an hour tonight. Uh, I just barely have time to show you this report from two days ago on Monday, where Jeremy Bowen reports from the old city of Damascus, where thousands of portraits of President Assad lined the streets. This is the heart of the old city of Damascus, and wherever you look at the moment, there are images of President Bashar al-Assad. Now, uh, his face is very common here, and... There are always lots of portraits of the president, but at the moment there are thousands, literally, and that's because of the election. Now, there are a couple of ways of looking at this election. There's the view you get from the opposition and from Western countries and from general critics of what the regime here does. And that is that it's a sham, that it's a bad joke. The question asked is, how can you hope to have a fair election in a country that's having a civil war. How can you have an election in a country, a democratic election, in a country that doesn't have any democratic institutions? Well, friends, there you are. That's it for our Wednesday night report, uh, an extended one-hour report for tonight. We'll be back, God willing, tomorrow night, Thursday, for another day's look at the current news related to the Bible and prophecy here on Nightcast. Until next time, friends, your host, Stephen Lloyd, saying so long, good night, friends. You have been watching Nightcast with Stephen Lloyd Gilbreth. Nightcast can be seen Sunday through Thursday nights here on COGTV.org. Tonight's program is also available anytime on demand in the COGTV.org video archive.